beginning a new teaching series in a, a Bible book that's tucked away in an obscure corner of the Old Testament. Um, so turn to the exciting Old Testament book of Esther, if you would. We'll go there in a, a little while, but I have some things to, to share with you before that. It's one of those books that uh, seems to be a bit neglected in some ways uh, in the Bible. And yet, as I've begun to study it for myself, uh, again, I'm seeing that, uh, as in all scripture, God's in charge. God's in control of everything. There's a popular worship song, I think we maybe sing it here, I'm not sure, but I know I've sung it a few times. Uh, it's a popular, uh, relatively new song that says, You are a waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And even when man uh, is behaving badly and in every sinful way that he can think of because of his sinful nature, God always seems to find a way to work out his will, working everything out uh, to his ultimate glory. And it amazes me, and I'm sure it amazes your mind as well, that God can do such a thing. You know, we sometimes look at our, our situations, our personal circumstances, and sometimes we scratch our heads and uh, we, we sometimes maybe even hang them in despair. And we wonder, where are you, God? In this situation, where are you? Maybe relationship failures, job struggles, and the present, for some reason or another, seems miserable. Maybe there's uncertainty about the future, your future. The past maybe is filled with some regret. And, and when you pick up the Bible, God's Word, and it seems lifeless when you try to read it. And prayers seem to, uh, to bounce off the, the ceiling of heaven. And God seems quiet and He seems so distant. Uh, and there's no explanation that you can think of as to why that might be. Well, this morning I want to show you that God always has a plan for our lives, for your life and mine, a plan that's much, much more than we can even begin to think or imagine. And that everything that has or everything that does or everything that will happen to us, God, who's in control of everything, has allowed in his wisdom everything to happen, and even in his goodness. And so as we begin this, this series today, in the book of Esther, I want us as his people who are loved by him to see what God's up to in the life of this woman called Esther. I wonder is there anyone here this morning and you want to see what God's up to in your life. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand but you know if you do, if you want to see what God's up to in your life. I know I do sometimes because I think he's not doing very much. And yet deep down I know that he cares for me more than I'll ever be able to, to know. And so as we read through the book of Esther, and I encourage you over these weeks to, to do that, to, to read the book of Esther. It's an easy book to read in many, many ways. Uh, uh, we'll see a drama unfold, a drama unfold in, the, in Esther's story about how, uh, how, will, how will God's people live when God doesn't seem to be nearby or close uh, and, and that's always an interesting thing to, to think about. Listen, don't judge the quality of your faith walk by your experience on a Sunday morning when you're surrounded by friends and by, uh, by people in fellowship and people praising God and, and, and you're remembering the truths of the gospel as they're presented. Judge the nature of your spiritual life, your living faith in the, those moments when none of that exists, when you're alone, and when it seems like God has walked away or isn't there, and the heavens seem like brass, and it seems like the promises of God don't include you, and it looks that even that some bad people are prospering, it can be a bit of a struggle sometimes. We'll see in Esther as we go through this story. We'll see an arrogant king who has great power and great wealth, but who has no heart for God. And you'd think that maybe Esther is the story of a woman who gains power and changes history. But it's not that. It's that in the moments where God seems absent, 
that God is actually very actively working. God will never stop working until his work is complete. He who has begun a good work in you will we'll, we'll finish it, will see it to the end. Uh, and to do that, he, he invariably, as you read through the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, he invariably will raise up unlikely and ordinary people. And we'll see here how he raises up a woman who he uses to continue to protect and propel his plan for the people of God and his plan for all the ages, his great plan of redemption. You know, the first two chapters uh, of Esther really serve as an introduction to the whole book. In fact, in the first chapter, I don't think Esther's even mentioned. Uh, but we'll see, as we read them, uh, the opulence and the luxury uh, of that ancient empire of Persia, along with its, its weaknesses. And we'll see the fall of one queen and the rise of another. We'll see a king who does everything in, in an exaggerated and extreme way because he can. But we also see a humble, lowly Jewish woman being promoted to a position of, of some authority. And so we're going to look at just a moment in chapter 1 uh, and then chapter 2 next week. And as we read through uh, our way through this, and I'm going to, to do that, I'm just going to read and pause and read and pause and, and see what God has to say to us. Uh, but we'll see that this book is, is really like a novel. It's, it's a narrative that tells a story. Uh, it's an historical story. These events actually really happened. And, and today we just need to set the scene as we, as we read the text. So I don't know if you've got to, uh, uh, to the book of Esther. Um, but if you can't find it, there's an index in your Bible somewhere. Uh, and don't be embarrassed to, to, to look it up and see what page it's in. But before we launch into the text, uh, in a moment, to see what's going on, I need to give you a little context. It's always good to have a context. At this time in history, the Jews are a conquered people. In fact, the book of Esther fills an important gap in the biblical record because it gives us a glimpse into what happened to the, to the vast number of Abraham's exiled descendants who chose not to return to the land of Israel when they were given the opportunity to do that. You remember that God had made a covenant with his chosen people in Leviticus chapter 26 in the wilderness of Sinai when he promised to bless them in every possible way if they obeyed him. But if they didn't obey him, he swore, it says in his wrath, to send them into exile. Well, they didn't. And he did. And they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And eventually Babylon was defeated by the Persians. And sometime after that, King Cyrus issued a proclamation in keeping with a prophecy that was given in Isaiah chapter 44, allowing exiled Jewish people to return to their homeland, to build the walls of Jerusalem and, 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 and the temple. Less than 50,000 Jews returned uh, to Judah. And for whatever reason, many more uh, remained uh, in places like Babylon and Persia and wherever else they had settled in exile. They stayed there. Now the books of Ezra and, and Nehemiah and Haggai tell us what happened to the people who returned to Jerusalem. But only the book of Esther gives us a glimpse of what happened to some of the people who stayed in exile. And it's designed to show us God's providential care of his people, ruling and overruling events for the preservation of his people. Are you with me so far? Just nod. Yeah, I'll tell me you're awake as well. Good. <laughs> Next, you need to know about King Ahasuerus. He's also known as Exert, uh, Exerces. He was in the third year of a 21-year reign, ruling his vast Persian empire from India uh, to Ethiopia. And he was ruling from his palace in a little place called Susa that is still there today in modern-day Iran. And there was no one more powerful than him at this time on the earth. Uh, and he himself was, 
the grandson and the son of great conquerors, but he hadn't done yet, you know, he hadn't done much yet himself, except to inherit this vast empire and, and fortune that went with it. Um, everything he had had been handed down to him. Let's just say he wasn't born with a spoon in his mouth, he was born with a box full of spoons in his mouth. And he was, he was spoiled rotten. And he did just whatever he wanted to do, whatever he wanted to do it, and spend it, spend whatever he wanted to spend. And he just ruled and lived it up and had a great life. And it's important to understand him because it tells us something about his character that we'll read in these opening verses. And one more thing that you need to know is what stands out most as we read through the book of Esther. Some of you will know this already. It's not from what's written in the text but rather from what is absent from the text. There's no reference in it to worship or to faith. There's no prophecy of Christ. The name of God is never mentioned. There's no mention of heaven or hell. You won't read of anyone praying or of angels or of heaven or of hell. There, there's no overt miracles or supernatural events. No one is healed of leprosy or raised from the dead. There's no Red Seas being parted or a fiery furnace, uh, survival stories, none of that. In short, there's nothing very religious in the book of Esther. But despite that, God's, as I said, God's, although God's name is not mentioned once, yet God's hand is clearly present and active throughout the book. The hand of God. Scottish Presbyterian pastor and scholar of the last century, James Hastings, has written the book of Esther does not say much about God but his presence broods over it all and he is the initiator that moves the movers that are seen and finally it's important to realize that nothing out of the ordinary really happens in the book of Esther to be sure there's several main characters that we'll, we'll see over these next few weeks that do some stupid and sinful things but there's nothing unusual about that. There's a drunken party, there's a battle of the sexes, there's a beauty pageant, there's various displays of arrogance and anger, there's treachery and deceit, murderous intentions, retribution. Just the kind of everyday stuff that's still going on in the world today. But it's a revelation of how God can bring about his will. Listen, God can bring about his will through the free will choices of men who are unconscious of any coercion from God. That's the amazing thing about God's will and our free will, how God brings about his will. Now, there are three books in the Bible about women. Esther, of course. What's the other one? Ruth. Ruth. And the other one is? Matthew. Huh? Matthew is about women? No, no. about Mary, you know. No, but a book. Judges? No, no. not Judges. Quick quiz. Okay. Brian, you must know. No. How about the Song of Solomon? Oh, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, right? But it's really Esther and Ruth that are the main, main books. But Song of Solomon is about a female. But Ruth was a Gentile who married a Jew. Esther was a Jew who married a Gentile. Both women had faith and courage and both helped to save ultimately saved and preserved the nation of Israel. Ruth, by birth of a son, you know, the, the lineage that went through from Ruth uh, to eventually Christ was born. And then Esther, by the death of someone, the death of an enemy who was uh, going to uh, exterminate, annihilate the people of God. And another oddity around the book of Esther, for those of you that are interested in Bible study, is that not a single commentary was written on this book until about 700 years after the birth of Christ. In fact, a serious commentary of lasting value wasn't produced until the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. And even then, spiritual giants like Martin Luther and John Calvin, they've left us no commentaries on the book of Esther. But the fact that the unseen sovereign has guided uh, events so that the book of Esther has, has found a permanent place in, in, in the canon of Scripture should be enough for us to approach it 
with confidence. And it really has been, as is all of Scripture, inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, as we read in Timothy. It's just as inspired, even though it never mentions God and has no great religious connotations. But the book of Esther is just as inspired and inerrant as the Gospel of John or the book of Romans. So let's begin reading the narrative uh, from chapter 1. We'll just go to the first, first eight verses. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces straddling from India to Kush. At that time King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa and in the third year of his reign he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendour and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material with silver rings and marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of periphery, marble, mother of pearl and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other. And the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. In other words, there was a, an open bar. Now, I might have lost some of you after the second verse of that, but let me paint the picture for you of what's going on here. Xerxes has, has all his wealth and time on his hands, and so he decides one day to invite his friends over to the palace from all over the empire. And he shows off his great wealth and he's bragging about all his, all his stuff. He says, come on over to my place and we'll party. And we'll party for six months. And I'll show you a good time. And he's bragging and he's trying and probably succeeding to impress his military leaders and officials from all over the empire. And it goes on for six months. And then the capital, he throws a party that lasts for a whole week, a king-sized party. And he has so much wealth that anything goes. He says, I can do anything I want. No one's going to stop me. And so he's so full of himself that he removes some of the restraints that they normally wear about drinking in the king's presence. And he says to his slaves, whatever a man wants, and probably a woman as well, give it to them. And then some more. And we're not told why he's throwing this party, but we do know that he's invited as his advisors and the people in charge of his empires, 127 provinces and from history we know that later on Xerxes was planning to attack Greece a few years later. It didn't work out too well for him actually. So maybe he was gathering support and, and, and strategizing for that campaign. But, but anyway you got the picture. And then we next meet another character. It's King Xerxes but look now at verse 9. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. The queen decided what's good for the gander, you know the rest of it, is good for the goose. <coughs> and so she decides to throw a party of her own. Now we don't quite know her motive for doing that. It might have been just a, you know, I don't know, an afternoon tea party where ladies drink tea and talk about whatever ladies talk about. Uh, but I think it's, it's much more like you know, anything he can do, I can do better. And so she does her thing. We read on verses 10 and 11. On the seventh day, the king, when King Xerxes was in high spirits, of course he was, from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, and it gives their names there, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely, lovely to look at. Can you imagine those seven bad boys partying for a week? They partied all week, drinking and eating non-stop. 
after partying for six months non-stop. And I can imagine by this time, whatever moral conscience any of them had, it was out the window by now. And the king, as it says in high spirits from wine, he gets this brilliant idea. He's so full of himself, he can't resist bragging one more time. And he commands these seven, uh, seven men to go and get his wife. So he can show her off. Tell her to wear her crown. It's like he was saying, you know what guys, you think you've seen it all, you've had a great time, but I've saved the best to last. And when you see my wife, you're really going to wish you were the king. But let's hear what happened next. Verse 12. Verse 12. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. She refused to come. The king's been shown off for six months plus a week having his ego, ego massaged by his invited guests and his wife brings his party into a sudden halt by refusing his command to appear before him with, uh, and his friends. And instead she decides she's going to protect her dignity. Bravo for her. Bravo for her. There's a whole teaching there for, for women about not giving in to certain things and protecting your dignity. Uh, but we're not going to do that this morning. But the servants return and they have to, I suppose, grovel before the king and report, Your Majesty, when we took your command to her, she basically said, uh, well, Get lost. That's what she said. She's not coming. Well, what's a king to do when he's just been upstaged and he's just been embarrassed by his wife? Well, first of all, he gets mad. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. And then he decides he's going to get even. We'll read on verse, verse 13. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. He mentions their names again. Uh, uh, special access to the king and were the highest in the kingdom. And according to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes, and the eunuchs have, uh, have taken to her. Then one of these guys replied, in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but against all nobles and the peoples of the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all women, so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she wouldn't come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the Queen's conduct will respond to all the King's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the King, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed. If Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes, also let the King give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. And when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. And the king and his nobles were pleased with this advice. So the king did as uh, Mamukin proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, each province in his own script, and to each people in his own language, proclaiming in each people's tongue that every man should be ruler over his own household. How do you like that? How do you like that? So he gets his experts together, get into a huddle, work on the game plan, and of course, either real concern or just to bolster his position as a king and their position with him, they, they tell him that not only has he been insulted by his wife, Queen Vashti, but her actions might stir up the wives of everybody else to act as well. And it says there will be no end to disrespect and discord. And so they advise him to tell her that Vashti, you're gone, you're out of here, you're done. You're history. I'm going to find somebody else and replace you. Bye bye, see ya. And he issues this decree, sends it out all over the empire. It's quite a story so far, isn't it? And we've only gotten into the first chapter. But I'm sure that you've noticed God's not mentioned anywhere in all of this. All we've read about is this pagan king and the sinful behaviour of all the people. And so we might ask again, where is God in all of this? Where is he? 
and, and our ignorance concerning God's nature might, might lead us to conclude, well, at least nowhere to be seen. He's probably too busy dealing with the Israelites who have returned from exile. Wrong. Here's the message I want you to hear this morning from Esther chapter 1. Someone's going to become queen and God's not in the guessing business. He's not surprised by anything. In fact, uh, in fact, listen to me now. He, he has chosen, he has permitted all of this to come about because he's got a plan and he's working out his sovereign will. And someone might say, well, Master, what about Vashti? Things didn't go too well for her, the Queen. I want you to learn this lesson well this morning if you didn't appreciate this truth already. Listen, God is not, it's not God's goal to give us what we want and what makes us happy and what makes sense to us. God's goal in our lives, in every situation and circumstance, is to give us what brings Him glory. It always has been, and it always will be, it will be, so we need to get used to that truth. Amen? Amen. Any one of us could say, but I'm going through <coughs> this tough situation or this tough circumstance. It's not fair. How can a loving God allow me to uh, have to face and endure this? Look what's happened to me. Listen, I, 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 I hear you as I hear myself in that. And I know it's hard to accept, and we have to look deep within. But the truth is that God works to do for him whatever he wants to do for his glory. And listen, we're blessed. We're blessed just to be part of God's story in any way whatsoever. The only way to get our hard heart around all this, to gain understanding of all this, is to really remember and realise and accept that God is other than us. He's greater than us. He's sovereign. Lord of all the earth. And when all is said and done, as Abraham said of God himself in Genesis 18, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God is good. God is loving. God cares for us. And although we may not understand it or like it at times, God sometimes allows things that don't seem good for us. And the Nestor will see over and over again, he's orchestrating events so we might be involved in lifting him up, in him being worshipped. And in him getting the applause and the glory. So we have to understand this, this idea, this concept of the providence of God. And I want to give you something to chew over this morning. And it's not easy. In fact, it's a bitter pill to swallow. But I can tell you from personal experience that there's nothing sweeter than the calm assurance in the midst of a storm. And that God still got his hand on the wheel. And is fully in control of everything concerning me. Even though it might not seem like that at the time. It might seem like the opposite. So we have to look deep this morning. <laughs> and if I can say this, I want to irritate and agitate you spiritually. So that you'll want to search the scriptures for yourself. And pursue answers to your toughest questions about what goes on in your circumstances. I wonder, is there anyone here this morning who can say, Pastor, I can think of a circumstance, I can think of a situation in my life, and if I'm honest, it's hard for me to see where God was in it. I questioned why I had to go through this, uh, this experience or that experience. I don't think I deserved what happened. And honestly, I wasn't sure where God was in it all. Again, you don't have to put your hand up, but have you ever thought something like that? Well, let me tell you a few things about God's providence. First of all, we have to understand that God preserves his creation. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17, where Paul, speaking about God, says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Do you know what holds this pulpit up? Well, the seats that you're sitting on? God. Because in him, all things hold together. Without God, without reckoning on God, everything would fall apart. If God is not God, if God ceased to exist, nothing would exist. Do you, do you get that? We generally live our lives without any acknowledgement or realisation that God is continually at work. I wonder this morning, can you do something for me, just for a moment? 
Okay, take a deep breath in. Hold it. And now breathe out. This isn't a Pilates class or whatever, but... Now I want you to promise me something. Promise me to keep doing that. Actually, you can't promise that. Because it's God who permits us to do that. In fact, he gives us everything we need, including the ability to breathe in and out, and even the air that we breathe. The psalmist in Psalm 104 says of God, when you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. We exist only because God exists. <clears throat> Folks, we could stop the sermon right there, with just that thought alone, and fall on our face and thank God that he gives us life. And he gives us breath. Not just the life that came into us when we were born from a, a, a twinkle in our parents' eyes, but life now, in this moment, and the next moment, and the next moment. And God will continue to preserve his creation, you and I, and he, until he decides when our breathing should stop. That's the providence of God. And secondly, Scripture not only gives us a glimpse of a God who preserves his creation, but also of a God who preserves his creation for his own purposes. As Paul puts it in Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 11, In him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Now I know that there may be some here this morning and maybe in some ways you're hurting over something. You're maybe struggling in different ways and I don't want to belittle what you're dealing with. But I want, you to, I want to encourage you to trust fully in the providence of God, a God who is working all things, the good, the bad and the indifferent, in conformity with the purpose of his will. God is never taken by surprise. He never says, uh-oh, didn't see that coming to you. He's fully aware of everything that happens in our lives. Take the universe, I've said it before, the sun, the moon, the stars, especially the sun. Just near enough, yet far enough away to do what God intends it to do. And he sustains it in that way since he has created it. And he sustains the physical world, even as we speak. There's probably, listen, there's probably a bear somewhere in the world with a big fish, probably a throat in its mouth. Or in his claws. Now, I couldn't care less about that, but the bear is very interested in fish. And it's God who provides the fish for the bear because he supports his creation. That's why I'm not bothered about this global warming, environmental stuff. God creates and preserves all things until the day he decides that the earth will be no more. So don't get too worked up or too worried about all this stuff. And then take the affairs of nations. Nothing can be decided behind closed doors or in any government that God is not aware of. He knows how we will vote even before a candidate is selected. And you may say, well, what if we make a mistake and we make a wrong decision about something? Listen, God never loses control of his sovereignty and his sovereign will. And even if we tried, we couldn't trick God or do something that might, might look like God didn't see it coming. No, he works everything, the scripture tells us, in conformity with the purpose of his will. And that's in spite, in spite of our fallen nature and being prone to sin. And then there's one more thing about God's providence we need to understand. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27. He has put everything under his feet. Everything is in subjection to him. He has power and authority over every person and everything concerning us and nothing happens to you or to me apart from sin without his permissive will and that's a tremendous faith building truth if you can grasp it you know it's illustri illustrated well in the Old Testament story of Job uh, Job was a righteous man a good guy as you probably know Satan comes to God and does what he asks permission to attack Job why? If we built Satan up to be strong and scary, and, and he is, and he's even called the God, the ruler of this world, why did he have to come before God? Are you ready for the truth? Even Satan has to come to God for permission. 
Because God has authority and rules over Satan. And even Satan comes on, uh, under the umbrella of God's authority. Hallelujah. I'm glad about that truth. I don't understand how it works. But I take comfort from the truth that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And then Proverbs 16 and 33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And we could take that literally and flip a coin and say to God, Okay, God, God is it going to be heads or tails? And you know what? He probably knew what it was going to be before we even flipped the coin. In fact, he even allows the coin to spin in the air. Is that not a big God? He is a big God. He's never caught off guard. He knows what's happening. Romans 8, 28 says it perfectly. If we could only really believe it with an upward look, when life gets tough, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, and who have been called according to his purpose. And we know. Do you know it? Not just think about it. Or feel it. Or maybe. Sometimes. We know. God directs people's circumstances and events. He allows stuff to happen. I mightn't like it as I said. Or understand it at the time. But God knows what he's doing. And when something comes against me. God is somewhere in the midst of that. And instead of looking inwards and saying, it's not fair, God. That's not what I wanted. Like a child throwing the toys out of the pram. We have to learn that the purpose of everything is to lift God up high. And my life has purpose and has accomplished something when he gets the glory, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Folks, we need to understand the reason why we're here. We're here to die to ourselves. And allow God to live out his purposes through us. God doesn't always and only do what, do what pleases us. He does what pleases him. And yet we're constantly consumed. Telling God what his business is. And what he should do. And we've kind of turned our theology. Our belief about God upside down. We mightn't even know it. Because God is only interested in his glory. And finding true worshippers. And sure, we, we don't have it easy at times. And neither are the saints of old, of course. Even David, a man after God's own heart. How many times we read of him calling out to God in frustration and in anger over different situations that were against him. But he always came back to this, Lord, I give up myself and I give in to you. I surrender to your purposes. Do whatever you think is best. And doesn't God say to the prophet Jeremiah, then... Thousands of years ago, and still today, through the ministry of his Holy Spirit and his word, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you. God knows the plans he has for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God has called us to enjoy life according to the values of his kingdom, not this world. And I, for one, am glad because, you know, left to myself, I can tell you, I mess up my life every time. I hardly know at times what I'm doing. But I'm glad knows, God knows what he's doing in my life. Amen. And in the midst of all that, the amazing thing is we have freedom to choose. I'm going to close in a moment. But remember Joseph in the Bible, the dreamer with the coat of many colours. Young son of many, rejected and hated by his brothers. Remember them plotting to kill him and lying about him and he's lying in a ditch or a pit and then he's sold into slavery and then you probably recall how he was thrown into a dungeon on false charges he had every reason Joseph had every reason to shake his fist at God what he was going through but he understood that God was in control and he as Joseph had freedom to choose he could run from God or he could run to God and embrace him and that's what Joseph chose as you read his story and God brought him to be second in charge of the land. And then there came the famine, of course. And Joseph was in the right place, storing food. So when his brothers, who had offended against him, showed up not knowing who he was, needing food, he was able to testify in Genesis 50 and 20, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish that which is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
Folks, God works despite our sin or the sin of others, despite the choices we make because of our sinful nature. He's willing to forgive. He's willing to walk with us through every experience in our life to a better day if we're willing to humble ourselves and surrender to him. But let me finish with the greatest example of the providence of God, and it's the cross, isn't it? That we've just celebrated in communion. In his great sermon after Pentecost, Peter declares in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, this man, that is Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Even before creation, God has said to him, I'm going to create something and someone and they're going to make a sinful choice, but I'm going to send you, Jesus, to become sin and die in their place so they can be free, free from the burden of sin and that they can have power, power in the blood of Jesus and be restored to everlasting life. Isn't it amazing? The church... And the world today have never stood in greater need than the need of the message of the sovereignty of God. We need to be reminded that he has not resigned the reins of his sovereign and providential rule in the world, even though it may seem like it sometimes, or in the lives of men and women. And our response requires our constant humble submission and obedience. He's forever in control of everything, including our lives. And he's prepared for today, and he's prepared for tomorrow, and he's working all, all things according to his purposes. And he has not forgotten us, no matter what we're dealing with, because in him, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Amen. Amen. And so as we continue in these coming weeks to look at this marvellous book of Esther, <laughs> A book that Martin Luther, the great reformer, lamented about. He lamented about it even being in the Bible. But there it is. I hope we'll be more and more encouraged as we see the hand of God moving in the background of Esther's circumstances. And we'll see ourselves in relation to God's providential care. And we'll be able to declare over and over again as we, as we will, as we sing our final song this morning. Lord, you are sovereign over us. And we make that declaration this morning and leave this place believing that, knowing it to be true, that he is sovereign over us. Let's just bow our head in prayer for a moment. Father, it seems at first glance that there's very little in this book of Esther, even in this first chapter, Lord, that you would teach us, and yet, Lord, there is. Your Holy Spirit, Lord, has instructed it in such a way and constructed the story in such a way that we can begin to see your hand moving in the background of the life of Esther and King Xerxes and Queen Vashti, and you're bringing about a plan that they didn't even know about. And, Lord, so it is in our own lives. Things happen, Lord, and we can't stop them from happening sometimes we cause them to happen and sometimes there's pain and there's suffering and there's anxiety and all sorts of stuff that we uh, worry about but father let us never lose sight of the fact that you are the lord of all creation you preserve that which you have created and you preserve it for your glory and lord you hold out all things together and Lord, we just pray that in those times when we might find ourselves falling apart because of one thing or another, and Lord, we confess that that happens. Sometimes, Lord, we can't bear the things that come our way. But Lord, when we're falling apart, help us to turn to you and to realize afresh that you're the one who will hold us. You'll hold us through it all. And as the song says, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus and I've learned to trust in his word. Lord, embed these great truths, Lord, in our hearts and lives that we may grow up into you, Lord, 
that which is will glorify you, Lord, and which will bear fruit to your glory in your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen <coughs> and amen.